and just completely just lost it. And then uh, my friend up in uh, Aberdeen started uh, his own shop up. And he's like, will you be my junk wax guy? Because I don't know anything about anything in the 80s or 90s. So I was like, yeah, sure, that's okay. And then uh, he turned me on to the project. And I was just like, uh, I just probably, I did a year at Edinburgh College of Art, uh, helping them bring their website in. And uh, I just went, oh man, this is my jam. Like with baseball and art and this whole thing is blowing up. Like I just couldn't get enough of it. It's a fantastic trend that's happened. You know, it's, it's awesome. So, um, you know, I took all my old cards when I was a kid and I was already starting to make art with them. I guess it was like uh, November 2018, like Thanksgiving 2018 is when I started making my art. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, during the COVID thing, when everyone was at home, likewise, I was stuck at home. It's just like everyone else. And I wanted to save resources. I didn't, I was making these big you know, pieces of art, like you see behind me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that costs money, right? <laughs> you know, all the materials and, that, and effort and stuff. And it takes up a lot of space. And, you know, I'm, I'm stuck at home at COVID like everyone else. So I was like, I have all these old cards, junk wax that I grew up with. And some stuff that I purchased to make other art with. So I'm like, why don't I just paint on the cards and mm -hmm. it'll take up less space and I could make more art and I could sell it at a more accessible price. And lo and behold, I started doing that. And then Project 2020 kind of launched at the same time. And I had no idea that was going on or that was in the works. Uh, so that just, and you could see the chain reaction of all the card art that's happening since then, you know? Um, and it's really cool. So it's done wonders for. Uh, for people like me who like to create, but also I think for uh, the collectors and the hobbyists, because they now they're they're now more tuned into art, you know. And mm -hmm. what they were collecting, I always thought were pieces of art anyway. But maybe they didn't think of it as pieces of art; they just thought of it as a baseball card. So but now the collectors are looking at it differently. So yeah, no. So it's funny you mention that because I got turned on to it by um, Beauty of a Game, uh, Jimmy Parker. Awesome. That guy's great. Yeah. And he had posted something probably two years ago and there was a card. It was, yeah, it was baseball card as art card show. I think it was 2018. And it was just like, yeah, I never actually thought of it that way. And just kind of started looking at my cards going, yeah, there would have been some sort of designer that would have sat there and looked yeah. at it. I would do it there. And then I can go back and look at these. Instead of just trying to pull my Maguires, my Will Clarks, my Ken Griffey Juniors, I was like, no, I'm actually going to look at the physical card and enjoy the photography that was there, enjoy the layout that's there. And it just gives you a whole new perspective on everything. Absolutely. You know, um, the selection of the photographs that go with it, the design elements from set to set that change. I've, as I've been constructing my art, I've been studying some of those things. Like my the favorite parts of the junk wax that I grew up with were are the design elements on the cards. Uh, like some of my favorite are like the the nineteen eighty two set with the kind of hockey stripes. Yep, on, yeah, yeah. You know, and like the nineteen eighty six top set with the big uh, Napoli serial font on the top, which uh -huh. you probably see in a the top of my Bo Jackson right above my head over there is part of it. Yeah, absolutely. That's Bo, yeah. Um, and so I was making art just, I wanted to celebrate those iconic elements of the cards themselves, which I thought were, were the pieces of art, you know, they were awesome. Uh, so that was my goal in starting to make my art was celebrating those iconic designs of the past. And so it's funny you say that because uh, we were talking with John Schieser, uh, Eve is marked. And uh, I asked him, oh, I he, he uh, uses a lot of 86 tops as well. He's like, that font, like that just sticks out in my mind. And it's such a great font to use. Yeah. And it's, it's just so iconic. Um, anyone who has been introduced to baseball cards at, at that time, or, or maybe now, um, if they see that font, they automatically know what it is. It's immediately recognizable. Uh, yeah. So I think it's among the most iconic uh, things made from that whole decade. It's awesome. So I love working with it. Cool. John, you want to introduce us now? <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry about that. My uh, bloody PC is running like crap right now. Uh, can you guys hear me okay before we get started, just, just to make sure? Yeah, absolutely. I got you. Excellent. Okay, that's me. Finally got everything shared in that. It's just my computer was running like crap, as I say. Uh, we appear to be fine, though, so let's move on. <clears throat> 
And thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, once again. This is our second and final interview tonight. Um, my name is John McKellar. I'm with the Glasgow Comets of the Baseball Scotland National League and one half of Ballcaps and Bagpipes, which is normally a Baseball Scotland podcast. But as you'll be aware, if you've seen any of the previous live streams, uh, this is uh, a separate project that we're part of. It's the Negro Leagues Museum Baseball Art Fundraiser. Um the artist that we have for our second interview is Matthew Lee Rosen. Matthew, would you like to say hi? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm glad that you're here to uh, not only learn about me and some of the art that I make, but learn about our entire project for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum and how artists from all over the world um, have come together to help raise funds to preserve the historic um, stories of uh, racism and inequalities and injustices uh, so that future generations can learn from them. So I'm glad to be here. Very, very glad. Thank you for having me. We're so glad to have you. And it wouldn't be bowl caps and bagpipes without Jason Dare. Jason, say hello. How you doing? I'm Jason Durr, um, former league president and Baseball Scotland Hall of Famer. I'm also known as Bubba on Baseball and I'm the owner of Dugout Classics. And now, uh, we always like to start off with the same kind of question, Matthew, and uh, that would be, tell us about your baseball journey growing up. Uh, did you play as a youngster growing up? And if so, to what level did you play? And uh, what positions did you play growing up? Uh, I played a lot of backyard baseball when I was a kid. I, I never did it at an organized level, mm. uh, but I was just one of those kids that was always in the yard running around with a ball of some capacity <laughs> and uh and then you know with my friends playing our pickup games and stuff um and I, I i like to play middle infield when i was a kid um i'm a smaller guy i'm not a not a big stout person who would slog or anything uh but i was always quick so um i like to play the infield and uh try to run around the bases as quickly as i could <laughs> uh, i'm not gonna i wasn't gonna hit you know mash the ball but i could kind of point it where I wanted to and find a hole and just get on and, and run around. Um, and, and I loved emulating. I, I grew up a Chicago Cubs fan. I'm a lifetime Chicago Cubs fan. And uh, when I was a kid, uh, Shawan Dunstan was our shortstop for basically the entire decade that I grew up in. So uh, I always emulated him. I wanted to be Shawan Dunstan. He was, he was my idol growing up. Did you have any favorite memories uh, growing up going to Wrigley Field uh, other than, of course, the... Uh... 2016 World Series in the end of that course, uh, finally. Uh, do you have any particular games or memories that stand out uh, from uh, the well, growing up? When I was, uh, the first game I attended, I was, I must have been about eight years old. Um, and my dad, so <laughs> while I was born in the Chicago area, my family moved to Florida when I was a young kid. And then I would come back in the summers and visit Chicago to see, yeah, you know, I had grandparents here and aunts and uncles and stuff. And uh, so when I was about eight, my dad, uh, on a family vacation to the summer, um, took me to my first game at Wrigley. And, uh, you know, he, he loves to tell the story all the time where, you know, I fell in love with baseball. And, you know, I just looked that up, you know, sat next to him and just looked at him and gave him a big hug and said, thank you for taking me. And I think the Cubs played the Dodgers that day. And, um, you know, beautiful afternoon baseball at Wrigley Field in the summer. How could you not fall in love with that as an eight-year-old boy? So... That's, uh, that's when it all got started. Um, and then I guess about the same time, my grandfather started introducing me to baseball cards. So he, like most grandfathers like to spoil their grandchildren, he was just buying all these wax packs, like tons of them. And, you know, every time I would look and turn, like there would be like a wax pack on the floor or he would make them somehow like he would have them trickling down his pants leg and falling out by his shoe. And he'd be like, hey, what's that on the ground, you know? And so I just, you know, started collecting baseball cards that way. And, and like every other kid, you know, built up a massive collection that had rubber bands wrapped around a bunch of cards and they were stuck in like weird cigar boxes and stuff. Um, but, you know, that nostalgia stuck with me, you know, throughout my entire life. And so when I was sort of reintroduced to the cards again, um, you know, my parents have been asking me for years to, you know, they had boxes of them in their house. And they're like, we did take these out of house already. And so when I finally did, um, you know, just that those smells 
you know, the cardstock and the bubble gum and everything, it just like, it made my brain just go <laughs> and relive all those moments again and, and mm -hmm. fall in love with it all again. So um, it was a sort of a precursor, or I'd say an instigator or catalyst to me wanting to make baseball card art. Talk to us about your card collection. Do you still have your original collection? Uh, and if so, what side is it? And is there a particular card that you could never part with that's your all time favorite card that you've pulled? Um, well, uh, all, the, all the cards that I own are just cards that I had when I was a kid, you know? So you know, I, I eventually took them out of my parents' house and you know, one of my visits, I you know, flew them back to Chicago as my parents are still in Florida. Um, I remember going to the airport and I had them on my carry on. And so, you know, during the, through the TSA check, you know, they made me open up all the boxes and they're like, what is this? I'm like, yeah, it's just baseball cards, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. It's just baseball cards. And the cold sweat. Like, <laughs> See, but, um, Go ahead. I, oh, I'm sorry, Jason. Did you no, no. I was just going to say, it's funny you do that because we, we have a Super Bowl party every year. And we get somebody to send us a block of Velita cheese because there's a bunch of Americans and we don't get them very often. And every time we get sent over, it's always been checked by the drug agency to make sure it's just a block of Velita cheese. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty funny experience bringing them home. Um, but, you know, when I, did, I haven't really added to my collection that I had as a kid. Um, I, I like to make things. I don't really collect things except for mm. the things that I make so I don't really add on and buy cards today uh, when I purchase things today it's solely for the purpose of using it to make a piece of art that I have in mind um, if I could say there was one card I wouldn't part with um, it might be I have a Ryan Sandberg 1983 Topps rookie and I think that's probably one of my favorite cards um, mm -hmm. you know I have a box that's like the the valuable box, you know, like yeah. everyone has, and that one's in there. But uh, you know, I like them all, and I, it's not stuff I really intend to part with because I like looking at them and, and you know, triggering their memory again. That just kind of that's the value to me. So awesome, man. Uh, Jason, do you want to touch on more of the art side of things then? Uh, and then I'll come back here toward the end. No worries. So, uh, so you're not only an artist, you're, you're you quite do. I want to say a few other things as well. You're quite the entrepreneur. Um, yeah, I've always, I've always worked for myself. Um, so I'm sort of a, a you know a hustler. Um, just to not in a negative way, but you know I don't have like a paycheck coming in steadily or anything like that. I gotta, I gotta earn everything myself. So um, I mean, I, and I've always created things. Um, so in the past, I've had some clothing lines that I've done. I've had licenses with the major league baseball players association and the nfl player association uh i create my own things that i want to wear like this hat um i create tons of hats for myself uh and occasionally someone will ask me to make one for them and, and i do um but i just like to create and uh creating lends itself towards entrepreneurship because you make things and it turns into something else uh, whether you intended it or not to, you know, sometimes you make something and you make it for yourself and none of the people want it. <laughs> so you can't, you know, you can't just stop the buck there. You got to let it roll. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was going to ask with a hat. So are you just a, a Kangol fan that you just said, you know what, I want to show my fanship on it. And then how it all started. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of my personal style is uh, wearing the Kangol type hat, which I'm sure you appreciate from where you guys live. Um, it's probably uh, more prominently worn there than it is in the United States. Uh, but, you know, I picked it up for my grandfather. My grandfather used to wear these caps when I was a kid. And, you know, and when he passed away, you know, when I was much younger, you know, I inherited all these baseball caps and stuff from him and, and Kangol's. And, uh, and it just, kind of stuck to me and later in life I started wearing them and it just became sort of my personal fashion identity so um, I wanted to customize them and make things that I, that I wanted because no one else makes them so I've got tons of these things you know I, I just I make one every every season or so for my favorite teams and stuff or other kind of imagery I want to wear and um, it, it's me man so whenever I, I used to fly a lot and I'd go through the airport and the 
all the TSA people would be there and be like, hey, it's the hat guy again. You know, they'd see me with a new hat. And, um, but it's how most people would recognize me if you see me walking down the street or something. I'm usually wearing a Kangol, so. I can appreciate that. Like, I, I always make sure if I'm wearing a certain hat, so I've got like 100 hats and I just rotate them every day. And then if I had the jersey to match it, I kind of like, I wear the jersey there. <laughs> you know, everyone knows I'm, I'm always wearing a hat or if I had the jersey, I'll match it, so. That's your personal style, man. Um, so I bet you got tons of stuff. I can imagine. I mean, well, I wanted to ask, how do you source all the jerseys and stuff that you find? Like, where does that come from? You're in the UK, so I can't imagine it's super easy to find American jerseys there, right? It's pretty hard. So this is why I started the company, because uh, I was buying jerseys just for myself. And I was getting tired of paying the import fees that are ridiculous, especially if you buy a brand new one. So uh, to give you an example, I bought the Mitchell and Ness uh, Dave Winfield jersey for my birthday present. It was on sale for like 200 bucks. I was like, great, fine. By the time I paid shipping and import fees and the taxes, it cost 200 bucks more. So it was actually more oh, taxes. Yeah. And so I, I was just trying to figure out a way to do it. And it wasn't until I was talking to... Uh, these guys that run um, the football vintage uh, thing over here, they're pretty big. Uh, and um, they had sourced a Brian Bosworth jersey. I'm like, I got to have that. And I was like, all right, so I get that. And uh, I was having a casual conversation with them. And I was kind of like, well, I've got my old football cards. But in the States, it's like, I'll get them shipped over, but it'll be really expensive if you want them. And they said, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. But if you do, like, this is who we use to import stuff. And all of a sudden it was like, Oh, well, this makes a big difference because I can get about 40 jerseys in a box and it only cost me roughly about a hundred bucks to ship. So much better. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so once I figure out that was how I could do it, it's fine. You know, I find a lot of stuff through uh, eBay and you try to find stuff that are just out there, but um, I'm not a big fan of just blank jerseys. Like I don't want to see a blank Cubs jersey. I want to see a, a Mark Grace jersey, a Ryan Sandberg jersey, you know, I, that, that's kind of where I want to see you. Know, I want you to have the player in the back and not just wear the generic jersey. So um, so I just kind of just pick and choose my way to see what I can find and just try to find some really cool jerseys and uh, and that. But yeah, uh, I spend a lot of time on the internet, just various places, Grail, Depop, eBay. Um, I reach out to other um, vintage shops and see if they have stuff. Like Mr. Throwback in New York's got a lot of stuff out there. Uh, and so I, I can usually get it, especially if somebody's asking for a certain piece, I'll go, okay, I'll, I'll look at those guys and see if they have one and then just get it over uh, and, you know, just to keep them happy. Awesome. Do you have a storefront too, or is it all online? It's all online. Like I literally just kind of had the idea and just was like, all right, let's just see what happens with this. Because if I'm struggling to find jerseys, everyone else in the UK will be having that same problem and, and Europe as well. So uh, I was just like, okay, let's just kind of buy um, like $5,000 worth of the jerseys and see how it goes. And then, it, you know, if I don't make it, that's not a big deal. I, you know, I, I make sure I get them in my size so I can wear them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's, it's really interesting because you find, like, I bought a lot of, like, Yankees and Red Sox stuff thinking they'd be super popular. I bought a lot of, like, uh, Cubs and, and Cardinals stuff because with the London games were supposed to happen. And, uh, and I thought that would be, like, really easy sells. But it turns out there's so much merchandise already out there that you can hardly move it. So you have guys that are like uh, Diamondback fans and they're like, oh man, you've got a Randy Johnson in a medium. Like uh, I'm in like, I, you know, where am I going to find a Randy Johnson jersey in, in the UK or Europe? Right. So it's a, I usually ask the guys that like run the team accounts because everyone's got their own team account here. I go, well, if you're looking for something, let me know and I'll track it down for you. And then you know, I, I just go into a big you know, hole on the internet to go find all my stuff. <laughs> Have you um, been able to find or acquire Negro League stuff uh, to be part of, you know? So, yeah, I like your Ebbets Field's pretty good at shirts. Um, their jerseys are probably out of the price range for most people here. So uh, I, I, people have asked, and I kind of put in the direction of Ebbets Field finals and said, if you want to get something, it's going to cost you 200 bucks. And they kind of go, uh, yeah, maybe not. Um, so, but uh, Team Brown Apparel does stuff. I need to reach out to them to see if they're going to maybe send some stuff for my raffle. Uh, and, you know, that was kind of how it all started. It was just like, 
I wanted cool shirts. I wanted cool jerseys and just started doing this deep dive. And that's really how I got involved with this sports art community, which is finding people that were just doing cool stuff. And I wanted to be that European guy that everyone was like, oh, this is, I know a dude in Scotland and he can get my stuff out there. <laughs> that's a good point. To, uh, to touch on that, actually, um, I find that really, it's quite, a, it's quite a funny thing. Uh, like over in the States, I don't, I don't think it's unusual for a jersey like a new jersey to to cost like a hundred or more dollars, uh, whereas over here, like with a football jersey, for instance, you're talking sixty to eighty pounds is probably the high end for those. Um, it's just a really odd thing uh, that I've noticed with American uh, jerseys, particularly baseball jerseys, uh, when I'm looking online. Um, <laughs> yeah. so I think that, that that's one of the that's one of the functions as well. I think that Jason's store. Um, Service is not just like the the ability to locate and source jerseys, but uh, obviously we've covered the increased personalization that you can find or a Randy Johnson jersey in particular. Um, but just affordable, the price range is like, you know, you've kind of already done the hard work, Jason. <laughs> 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 and, and it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a way to kind of reduce the baseball jersey market to the, kind of market that we're used to with uh, football or as you would call it soccer jerseys which as I say you wouldn't ex normally expect to pay more than 60 to 80 pounds at the absolute high end for, for a brand new jersey every season and, if you guys, if and also wear an advertisement on it at the same time too which is interesting <laughs> yeah exactly jerseys have ads on them you know so <laughs> people are going to pay for that to wear an ad all day that's amazing like <laughs> <laughs> really? See, you're looking from that from an American perspective. So uh, European football teams already have an ad on there and they've had an ad on for years. So it's not a yeah. big deal to see that. Whereas yeah. uh, that, that big swoosh just like, oh, makes me want to puke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but over here, that's more accepted here. And you kind of get a couple of guys were like, ah, okay, yeah, it's fine. You know, it doesn't look great. You know, um, I, I think it looks terrible on the classic jerseys, you know, Red Sox, Cubs, Yankees. I just, ah, oh, terrible uh the throwbacks like it, they should have something about the throwbacks they should put the swoosh on the sleeve for those i think it takes away from them um but i yeah. don't know what's wrong i don't know what's wrong with the sleeve in the first place you know that's where the majestic logo is on i'm wearing my yankee jersey under this sweater yeah uh, that's where the the majestic logo is on the old ones i don't know why they felt they need to change that up it's still there you're still seeing it all all, all through a game um i agree with jason in particular with the pinstripe jerseys uh it's the it needs to go. I don't like it. Well, they must have data to know that if it's if it's up here as opposed to this. Yeah, it's probably you, you're probably or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're probably right. They probably say, "Oh, well, if we move it to there, it will be seen on camera for 0.8 of a second more per game." Uh, it's yeah, unfortunately. That's but just it, all, it all started back in the Japanese series, and so when those games started being played in Japan, that's the first time you started seeing ads on them there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. Whereas like, uh, whereas, like <laughs> whereas like Jason says, uh, a European sport, it's been normal for like people to wear advertisements uh, forever. It's across the jersey uh, for you know for as long as I've been alive, pretty much. Uh, it, it's it's like at the, at the point where when someone releases a jersey, and it does happen that doesn't have the sponsor on the front. They might have it on the lower part of the back, or you know just kind of on the sleeve. You take you have to kind of do a double take and see what something kind of really different about that jersey it looks so odd <laughs> see it. whereas obviously with baseball it's the opposite it's like so weird to see the squish up in the kind of chest area um and it's not even terribly big but it's just when you look at some of these jerseys that have existed and you're a cubs fan you have seen kind of the same colors the same the same set up for you know your entire life for like 100 100 plus years these have been more or less the same uh to make any change to these traditional colours is uh, I think it's quite right for fans to be a bit pissed off about it. Um, I just understand the marketing aspect of it. So, you know, <laughs> I understand, you know, they're trying to sell things. So the more they change it, the more they get to sell. Um, and the fans will always complain about anything. It doesn't, it, regardless, you know, <laughs> So, you know, they're never going to be able to please the fans. And then the same fans who complain about the change end up buying a jersey anyway after they've been complaining about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, it's all about selling stuff. That's the bottom line. So, yeah, there's just, a reason they paid so much money for the sponsorship on that. You know, they, they, yeah. they were going to get their logo on it regardless. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
So that's nothing um, with us. We're here to talk about your work. So, <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get started? I say I'm, I'm particularly interested in the gum because it, the gum is amazing. Like when I first saw that, like why has never ever done that before? Because it's like the gum is just something about top baseball cards that's just stuck with me forever. Well, so, you know, obviously my kind of fond memories of my childhood with opening the Vax packs was, you know, the smell on the gum, chewing the gum, even though it was like this really hard stick of gum that probably didn't taste that good when I was a kid and it still doesn't taste good now. But that was just part of the whole process, you know? And so the nostalgia of it came back and I was thinking about the gum, like that was part of the, in the entire involvement of me with the baseball cards. And I wanted to learn more about the gum and tell stories about the history of the gum and the brands. And so, you know, I started reading up, you know, I learned um, that, you know, the Tox Chewing Gum Company was based in Brooklyn. And then shortly after World War II, uh, they created the Bazooka Gum brand with uh, their character Bazooka Joe. And then I believe it was just a couple years later, um, they started making baseball cards. And obviously they packaged the two things together to cross promote their products. Um, you know, the baseball cards were sort of an advertising vehicle to sell the bubble gum, just like the, or, you know, basically the, the tobacco cards in the, in the early part of the century were an advertising vehicle to sell cigarettes. Not really, they weren't selling cards. It was just an advertising medium, you know? Um, and then, you know, everything grew beyond that and the cards became sort of a product of themselves. So, you know, everything I make is very cognitive about telling a story about the history of the bubble gum um, and the history of the Topps brand. And then the, the other brands that followed suit, um, you know, there were the Fleer company, Fleer made bubble gum as well. They were famous for making double bubble. They were based in Philadelphia. So, you know, when they launched the first year that they launched their baseball card brands, they, they came with gum um, until a Topps uh, filed a lawsuit. Uh, they wanted exclusive rights to be the only baseball card company that could package their cards with bubble gum. So uh, for one year in 1981, uh, Fleer and Donruss, which is the leaf chewing gum company, both had bubble gum in their wax packs. And it was just that one year. Um, Fleer had some gum in their packs from other sports because that was not part of the agreement that Top signed. So uh, I believe Fleer made football cards for a while before that uh, and maybe some basketball cards in the earlier years. And then in 1986, they rebirthed their basketball cards, if I'm correct, with the famous uh, set that has Michael Jordan's rookie card in it, which mm -hmm. is one of the more iconic cards you'll ever find from the decade. Yeah. Um, but so I wanted to learn about all that history. And then I want to tell stories about all that history with my art. So when I make an art, everything is, is a visual story. Um, and, you know, I start with the story and work from there. Uh, so when I make a piece, like I'm going to show off some things in the camera in a moment um, for, for our function uh, for the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. But for instance, this one, uh, here's Oscar Gamble. Okay. Hope you could see that. Uh, I got a little yeah. reflect in the glass. Yeah. On the back, you know, Oscar Gamble, um, he actually came up with the Cubs. Buck O'Neill, the great baseball legend and Negro League legend, uh, worked as a scout after his playing career. And he recommended that the Cubs sign a young Oscar Gamble. Uh, and Oscar Gamble, play, he played with the Cubs for a very short period of time. Um, it was said that they traded him because he was dating a white woman and the upper management of the Cubs didn't like that. So he got dealt, he got dealt to Philadelphia and he found his way to San Diego. And he later, um, as he's kind of grew into his own, he got traded to the Yankees and the Yankees made him shave his, his huge Afro, which he's pictured here. Mm -hmm. And you know, there it is captured in the back in my bubble gum kind of um, style. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was just part of the Yankees culture in their clubhouses. They wanted everyone just clean shaving uh, with a clean hairdo and everyone who played for the Yankees, that was just, you accepted that was part of the, the deal when you played for the Yankees. 
So it wasn't really a, necessarily a racial thing asking him to cut his afro off or, or trim it. Uh, it was just their culture. Uh, but the Yankees were such like a like a zoo-like atmosphere. They were the New York Yankees in the 70s. And, you know, the media was always around them. And this was before our media now, just, you know, social media. This was like, you know, journalists with, you know, tape recorders stuffing it in their face and, and you know, writing up in the newspaper articles. Uh, it was just a zoo. And so at one point, some reporters asked him um, what it's like to be part of the Yankees clubhouse. And his interpretation uh, is a famous quote in baseball history. He said, they don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. <laughs> and that quote was later attributed to him describing the amount of racism that goes on. So I have uh, but it do back here on the back of this card. Um, and this is in my bubble, bubble gum paint texture, which I've mastered. Um, and this is part of my offering for the MLBM uh, art program to, you know, funds for the museum to preserve that mm -hmm. history. Uh, so each, like, you know, this is a very cognitive story that I've planned to offer this product for ML, uh, MLBM um, because you know, we want to tell stories of the history and we want to preserve that history for future generations <laughs> to learn from uh, and, to, and to make a change, a positive change. Um, so, so to develop my little t painting technique, I bought old wax packs that had bubble gum still in them. Uh, I went online, I scoured for pictures online uh, where I could see like gum that was opened in a wax pack from maybe other brands and other years. Uh, just to see the actual size and shape of the gum. And I studied it to a T um, and then created a diagram. So I have like, I have a chart you know, on my computer that shows me like the size of every gum from every pack that I've been able to get my hands on or been wow. able to see. Um, and that way, when I make my art, like when I make like a, like a piece behind me, which is a giant gum stick, that's like 36 inches tall, like three feet. Um, I want to like do it at the scale where if that piece of gum was stuck to the back of a card, that everything would be scaled appropriately. So it would turn out just as it would normally be if the gum was stuck to the card. So everything there, like uh, the, the behind me is a Reggie Jackson and a Bo Jackson and a Gary Sheffield. Mm -hmm. And their portraits, their faces are cropped in a position where if the bubble gum was stuck to the to their card, that's the same uh, ratio, size ratio that it would be. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. awesome. I didn't realize that. That's so cool. Um, and that's just part of mastering the technique that I created to tell these stories. You know, I, you know, studied the gum, looked at the texture, looked at the color, some, uh, you know, Fleer and, and, and Don Russ's leaf gum may have been a little bit different color than the tops come. So when I create stuff, I try to, you know, keep it in the right tones and stuff and just try to match the history. Um, I'll only paint bubble gum on the back of a card if that card was originally packaged with gum mm -hmm. or if it's a sort of a facsimile of a card that would have been packaged with gum back in the day, you know, how they make these kind of retro designs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wouldn't paint gum on a card that just doesn't fit that uh, storyline. So those are part of my guidelines personally making art. And those are also part of the guidelines that I ask uh, if, if I have customers who want a commission or something, uh, I have them keep that in mind that that's what I'll put gum on. So, so do you take uh, commissions on cards that say didn't have bubble gum then? Or you try to just go, no, um, I stick with the bubble gum? Well, I do. I, and I just make other kind of art. You know, right. I just won't, um, you know, I have, I've done... I've created like a tobacco-like tar effect for yeah, I was to about those other ones because I saw your other ones that you do. So, yeah, I, I love that. It tells a whole different story. Um, and I've created uh, like the upper deck cards from you know when they first released their stuff in 1989 and 1991. Uh, upper deck was you know the the first premium card brand when they arrived. They were also like the essence of the whole junk wax period because you know the excess of it, but uh, when they arrived in 1989, they launched their brand as the first premium baseball card brand on this like really pretty white card stock, and they used holographic materials on the cards. 
So I started making some art that had holographic materials in it uh, as a tribute to that and, and to continue telling those stories. Um, like everything I do, it's a, con a concept and a story. Um, I, I, I don't just like decorate something. Um, I know other artists would like to do that, but for me, uh, everything has to be about the storytelling. It's a very important thing. All right, so that, that you say it's come to the storytelling. So what's the story behind the mac and cheese cars? The mac and cheese cards. Well, um, so I guess I think it was 1986, 1987. Um, uh, some of our watch reviewers might fact check me on the year. Uh, but, you know, at the retail level, when you went to the grocery store, there were baseball cards on the box of mac and cheese. Ah, okay. Um, so it's part of their promotional efforts. So, you know, if you were a kid who was loving baseball cards and, you know, mom or dad took you to the grocery store and you walked on the aisle and you saw that, you're like, well, we got to have mac and cheese and it can't be the, the off brand. It's got to be the real brand because I want, <laughs> it was, you know, Mike Schmidt is on the back of this box. Um, and then next week we're going to come back and we got to get the other boxes because I want to complete the set, you know. <laughs> um, and so, and you would just cut the box and you would have your card. So <laughs> I, um, I, I bought some mac and cheese recently and use the actual macaroni and cheese noodles in my design uh, in which I, you know, come up with a formula to make it look like real mac and cheese with the, you know, the drippy syrupy cheese. Um, I, I can appreciate that. I mean, I, I bought countless uh, 24 packs of Pepsi to get Ken Griffey Jr. cards. I, I bought uh, <laughs> no. um, Mother's Cookies had a series of, of, of baseball players there. I can't remember how many Mother's Cookies I would have bought there. And uh, we were talking with uh, with Herm, who does the, the Mets stuff, and uh, he had a Wheaties box on the wall behind him. And I'm, I mean, I've got all those Wheaties boxes as well. <laughs> I definitely had a Michael Jordan and a Waller Payton when I was a kid, for sure. Um, yeah, those Wheaties boxes were great. <laughs> John, do you want to ask your question here before we open some cards? And any comments from the viewers? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we have a couple of comments here. Uh, Stephen Loudon uh, on the baseball jerseys has said that during the early 2000s, I went through a few years of buying a lot of baseball shirts. Uh, he's going to dig them out and show them to us at some point. So we really look forward to that, Stephen. Um, Daniel Jacob Horine says, uh, Rosen, uh, with a... Oh yeah, Mark. Um, baseball art rock star. Good to see you on here. Awesome. Thank um, you for the shout out. <laughs> Tim Gordon says that I love Matthew's work. There's a really great design quality to everything he does. Um, he just has such a, an eye for it. And he's asking the question. Uh, I've always wondered: Is it freehand or stenciled onto the gum sticks? Is this question from Tim? From Tim Gordon, yeah. Tim. Uh, uh, I'm glad you're watching, Tim. Uh, Tim and I have communicated in the past privately. Um, uh, Tim's work is fantastic as well. And so hoping uh, one day we'll be able to connect and, and uh, kind of collaborate on something cool. Um, the, I use stencils to make what I want. Um, and I've, you know, I've come up with various techniques, uh, but I have like a, a desktop size vinyl cutter. And so I could design on the computer what I want I could run it through my vinyl cutter and then apply a vinyl stencil to the things that I make. Um, and then there's all kinds of other things involved, like making sure you have the right grade of vinyl so it doesn't, it's not too sticky to destroy the materials that you're working with. Um, like, you know, I learned that from trial and error, just, you know, using on cards, like, you, you know, if you put a, a, a vinyl that's too sticky, it's just going to rip up the card. Um, and occasionally I make some mistakes and, and it rips up. So I, I put them in my little error pile. Um, and, and I offer those cards to others. Uh, and then there's certain paint, paint techniques just so if you're working with a, a stencil, like a vinyl stencil, um, what it, whenever you paint things, it's gonna bleed underneath whatever stencil you're using. And so I've developed special techniques of my own to prevent the bleeding, which, you know, they're my kind of secret sauce. So um, I won't divulge on a, a, you know, on a large scale, but so all that goes in, you know, all the detail and technique and extra effort goes into making the product that I want, which, you know, I want a very high presentation quality product. So I can confirm that Tim is awesome. 
Like we met in the London series last year. And then I would happen to be down in Cornwall and I, I drove up a, an hour and a half to go and hang out with him one afternoon. And it was a, an awesome time. It was one of the best days I had my, my, my little vacation I had down that way. That's great to hear. Uh, you know, maybe one day when I, when I'm ready to hop on a plane again, you know, <laughs> be able to meet. So any other questions out there? Uh, yeah, we like to uh, close up uh, each of our Atlas interviews with the same uh, with the same question, and that would be uh, as an American and as an artist, and more importantly as a baseball fan, what do the Negro Leagues mean to you, and uh, how did you come to be involved uh, in the fundraiser? So, it, it's I didn't necessarily grow up uh, with an awareness of the Negro Leagues uh, or a strong awareness. I would say, mm -hmm. I mean, I did know what it was and i did hear stories of like satchel page and josh gibson so i was aware of it um you know at a minimal level when i was younger um as an adult i know a lot more about it um but my my interest and my kind of newfound passion about the negro leagues is more about humanity than it is about baseball um yeah. it's more about changing the world for a positive way um you know there are stories of kind of just the injustices and, and the racism and the segregation and the inequalities and then not only when they finally broke the color barrier and they were welcomed into the sport they were welcomed reluctantly and they had to deal with all kinds of unwanted you know affairs that came with it um being heckled all the time, being called bad things, uh, being the only, you know, black person on an all white team. And when they would travel, things were different. And when they were home, even though they were on the field together as a team, the rest of the teammates didn't really socialize with them. You know, when the game was over, all the white guys went and did what they did. And then, you know, the black guy was left to himself. He was still segregated. Um, and they, you know, those are sacrifices that they made for future generations. So as I continue to even learn more and I look back at it, um, my purpose, uh, and I started raising funds for the museum prior to this uh, big collaborative effort. Uh, but my purpose was just to preserve the history of this, you know, of these stories, of these injustices and uh, preserve it for future generations to learn from. So, they don't forget their history and they could use it as a lessons to help make positive change going forward. Uh, and thankfully, uh, Tad Richardson, who um, is running this in organizing this entire event, he's done a phenomenal job. So I got an extra thanks to Tad. Uh, but he reached out to me early, early going in his brainstorming efforts of this. Um, and I told him, Hey, I'm already donating things to the museum. And if, you know, I think it's a great idea that you want to create something on a larger scale. And he took it and he certainly ran with it. And he's built a really amazing um, event that I'm very proud to take part of. So. Thank you so very, very much, Matthew. Before we open some cards, would you like to plug your social media channels and website? Absolutely. Um, for those who are just learning about me today, uh, if you're not familiar with me, um, you could find me on Twitter or Instagram at Matthew Lee Rosen, uh, as you just like you see my name spelled on, on the bottom of the screen. And if you want to visit my shop, uh, you could click through links from my social media or just go to baseballcard.art. Um, and you'll be able to see a whole variety of stuff in a large collection of things that I've created that are all really fun and clever and, uh, and take a lot of hard work and effort. So please visit. I hope to do. Um, thank you again, and uh, let's open some baseball cards, guys. Yeah, let's do some stuff. Show me. So before we start <laughs> here, uh, the big question is a very controversial shirt in your shop right now about bringing the DH to the NL. Where do you stand on it? Oh. <laughs> As a Cubs fan, too. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, I do, I do enjoy, uh, the NL game and just the different kind of decision-making that goes on. Uh, but I'm okay with the change. I think it's a positive change. Uh, I, I think it, 
makes baseball a little more fun for fans. Um, and if my favorite team happens to be able to benefit from it because they have a good enough roster to, you know, maximize the DH spot, that's, that's even better too. So, <laughs> so I'm okay with the change. Um, yeah. Legalize a DH. Is, All right. That's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I have eight packs of cards here. You get to choose which one you want to open and we'll talk about the players that are there. So I, I got a feeling where I know which one you're going to pick, but I got 87 tops. It's always a good one for me. Yeah, it's it's, a, it's it's the only one that has gum in it too. So I, I got a few. <laughs> I might not need the rest of these. Eighty nine Donruss, nineteen ninety score, ninety one Studio, wow, ninety two Pinnacle, and let's see, ninety two Donruss, and let's see, was it ninety three Studio? And the final one is Big League Baseball, which is the modern one. Wow. It's amazing how the packaging has changed. You know, yeah, you start with the wax pack and then it gets into these fancy foil packs and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I got to see some bubble gum, man. So you're going to have to open the 87 tops. So I you're... thought that would be the case. Yeah. All right. So every pack of these, the, the gum has been stuck to the back of it. Uh, the last one we opened with Peter Chen, he pulled the McGuire rookie out of that and a Will Clark rookie. Oh, fantastic. So as you can see, there's the gum. It's stuck. Oh, it's stuck. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, I love it. Can you hold it even closer just so everyone can see kind of what the gum, what the texture of it? Yeah. Ah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. It, it, it's, it's not coming off. Uh, oh, that one might, but yeah, it's, it's definitely stuck. Have a have a chew. Go, Jason. No, I've done that already. Have a chew. Experimenting. Have a, have, just have a chew. Go. No, <laughs> we've got a meeting here at yeah. one o'clock in the morning, and I, I listen, don't want to for it. Listen, you know Matthew's a massive bubble gum guy. Give him a chew. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> just a just a just little. Piece. How hard it is. All <laughs> right, fine. I'll, I'll do the chew at the end because I, I I've, <laughs> I've got whiskey and water here, so I get that pretty quickly. <laughs> All right, so he's come up a few times now. We've got Dave Henderson, Hendu, with the Red Sox. Oh, fantastic ball player. Uh, war number 42, I believe. Ooh, maybe. For uh, a handful of years. Oh. So you might recognize this guy as the pitching coach for the Pirates, Ray Surge. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And those uh, unis are awesome. Uh, do you have any of those retro Sox ones? I, I've had them in there. They don't last very long. Like literally, uh, there's a guy who he he actually donated something for the auction on him running the raffle, and uh, he literally like got PM me one day and goes, "You have four White Sox things. We, we, I'll take them all." And I was like, "All right, there you go." So there's a dude in Wales that's like a big White Sox fan, and it's completely cleared me out. Very cool. All right, you got Dave Lapointe from the Padres. Ah, I just wrote on the back of that card earlier oh, today. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I like to write little thank you notes on stuff when I when I ship my cards out, and that was one of them. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. All right, let's see. We have the Braves team leader card. I don't yeah, that was it. one of the designs that I was never really fond of. It was with that that team leader with like the you know faded edges of the photograph and stuff. I'm just trying to actually see who actually. Are those players? Because I don't know. <laughs> it's a tough one. It looks like Ken Oberfell. Uh, I don't know. He looks. I don't know. Oh, there we go. I think he's a current ESPN broadcaster. We got Harold Reynolds. Oh wow! Oh, yeah. So three-time uh, three-time Gold Glove winner for the Marlins, wasn't he? Yeah, and he was the guy that won the stolen base record the year Ricky was hurt. <laughs> it's a story that Ricky <laughs> told him and told him, said, Congratulations on your win. I was hurt. I'll win it next year. <laughs> yep. Hey, he that's my belief. He got gunned out at the plate by Bo Jackson in one of the most amazing throws that you'll ever see. So mm. I encourage anyone to, you know, after this, to YouTube that uh, Bo Jackson throws out Harold Reynolds. Awesome. You know what the best thing about that? He did it flat footed. Mm -hmm. oh, he just picked it up and threw it 300 feet on a dime. It was crazy. <laughs> just fantastic. All right, John, you're going to like this one. Dummy baseball. There he is. That'll be going straight to your grave, I imagine. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, it, the collection's growing. Every time we pull the Mattingly, it goes right up. <laughs> How many uh, Mattingly jerseys do you own, John? 
I don't own any. I have one Yankee jersey. It doesn't have a name on it. Um, I only have the, the old pinstripes. Uh, I only got my first uh, baseball jersey late last year. I uh, That reminds me, actually, Jason, you have an Aaron Judge jersey waiting on me, I believe. I do, yes. Which I was supposed to buy from you about six months ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Still waiting for you. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a shout about that. But uh, yeah, uh, just, uh, just the one jersey so far. Yeah, I think uh, you need an Addingly in that collection for sure. You got you to match all the cards you got. Oh, man, I had a man yeah. league, and the guy that runs the New York Yankee uh, UK account bought that because it was actually a proper one. It didn't have the name of the back, just the number. Right. So. He was, oh, that's right. I didn't even think about that because they don't have their uh, names on the back. Yeah, exactly. Cause I get that question a lot. Uh, why, why, why the names in the back on the Red Sox and Yankees jerseys? I said, well, people are going to ask for it. You're going to want one that way. But uh, the guy was super excited to actually find one that didn't have the name in the back. That's awesome. All right, here we go. Kirby Puckett. Oh, legend. what a fantastic legend. Mm -hmm. I love the how the helmet. Like I said, I really like those twins red there. I kind of forgot they wore those red helmets. I, I can't remember. It was see because it was 87 is when they went to the World Series. And that's when they did the whole new scheme of things there. So you got to kind of look yeah. back on it. Yeah, because that photograph is from the year before. Yes. Um, excellent card. Right. So we got Expo, Wallace Johnson. Wallace Johnson. He looks like he just stroked a single to right field there. <laughs> that looks like a very a very painful batting stance. That, that, that looked like it would have caused him some issues in later life. <laughs> <laughs> we got Storm and Gorman Thomas. Nice oh, mustache. Excellent card. Look at that stash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's the best thing about the wax packs is everyone had an <laughs> awesome yeah. mustache. Damn, and some, some of them have the... Some of them have the uh, the, the Jericho curls or the mullet as well. <laughs> All right, here we go. We've got Rick Russell. It's not a great card, but I love the pirate tax. They were still throwing that. They, they were still had that stripes. Yeah, that was a great hat. Rick Russell had a pretty pretty good career. I have to tip my hat to him too. Yeah, I guess he the longevity. Yeah, I mean he had won 162 games at this point. Started with the Cubs in '72. Yeah. Braves manager Chuck Tanner. Chuck Tanner. I'd seen his face on a lot of baseball cards for sure. Is he, <laughs> is he wearing the starter jacket too on that? Oh, man. Yeah, it looks like it. Because uh, he would have been the manager, probably the last manager before uh, Bobby Cox, I'm guessing. Yeah, probably. That seems about it's... right. All right. We got another brewer. Ben Ogilvy. Ben Ogilvy. He played he had a long career. Gosh, he started. I didn't in, really remember much about his career. Yeah, he uh, let's see. He played soccer and baseball in high school. Oh, What's here. this soccer that you speak of? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Never heard of soccer. Doug Corbett. Corbett. Yeah. Reliever, probably. Yeah, definitely reliever. So. He looks like a ball player has been like, no, I can't be arsed having my photo taken today and got his like elderly uncle <laughs> he does not look like an athlete at all <laughs> so there there is somebody's card i can't remember who it was and they uh they had they paid the bat boy to stand in for the card <laughs> nice. notice. So that's they, amazing I, I can't remember who it is but if you google it you'll find it but yeah uh, mm -hmm. i paid the bat boy to be a stand-in for, for his card that's excellent all right there you go another twin greg gagne Oh, got it. He uh, he was very integral in the '87 World Series, I believe. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Starting. Yeah. Starting middle infield, a second or short. Shortstop. Yeah. All right. Bill Doran, second baseman for the Astros. Yeah, not a whole lot to say there. Okay, we're getting done. Another manager card, Halanier. Oh wow. Look at that pose. That pose just says, I don't want to be here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this says it's 90 degrees in Florida and it's just spring training and we got to go home soon. <laughs> so, guys, so, guys, to that point, like, is a baseball card something that you need to do uh, for your contract or is it a voluntary thing? I don't know if they, um, like, if you look at the photographs, mm -hmm. uh, most, um, most often the, they're not aware they're being photographed. So I don't think it's like a contractual obligation. Like they have to go sit down with a photographer. 
uh, from what I've learned from the stories, um, you know, photographers go out to fields in spring training or in the middle of season and they just start photographing stuff. And then hmm. the card companies purchase the photography for use on a card. Right. Okay. That's fair. I think they set a contract and they get some royalties from it. Hmm. So I think it's in their best interest, especially with the rookie guys. Yeah. You might as well get a few but bucks here and there. Probably all organized by their uh, the players' union. Yeah, the, the PA. I was going to say that. Yeah, the PA is probably the yeah. people who would deal with that sort of thing on their behalf. They just show up and cross their arms like like old manager man yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> Go over the day. <laughs> there, I don't know if it's true or not, but when Upper Deck started, um, there was a player named Bruce Dwayne. No, or is it Wayne de Bruce? No, I'm, I'm getting Batman and this guy mixed up here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Batman's a ninja. His hand eye coordinations are standing. I imagine he would probably read. <laughs> uh, and he took stock in Upper Deck instead of taking the cash out. And so he made millions off Upper Deck as taking a stock option instead of actually just taking the money. Uh, oh, wow. There. Good move. So, yeah. He so, is uh, Batman. Yeah, I mean, gosh, I mean, you remember Upper Deck? Everyone was buying Upper Deck. They were going yeah. for crazy money. So uh, I'll see if I can find that one later when we go there. All right, we're at our last card. We've got Dusty Baker. Oh, wow. Dusty he's Baker. in the A's uniform. I don't remember him for the A's, but... Uh, no toothpick in his mouth there? No, no. But it's got a nice stain from the gum in the back. You can oh, see all right. On. <laughs> all right. All right, I'm going to thank you for being on, and I'm going to eat the gum. And, and <laughs> so I'm going to leave this here. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll do the gum, and it will say goodbye. But I, Matthew, thanks for coming on. It's been an absolute blast. Um, I really like your work, and I wish you all the best in the fundraiser. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, meet you in person, I guess we could say, on Zoom. Uh, and, um, you know, looking forward to, you know, future interactions. And also looking forward to seeing you put that piece of gum in your mouth. You know? <laughs> yeah, it, it's all kind of falling apart there. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's is it hard as a rock? On it. So, um, all right, here we go. Hey! Um, very he's dusty. A he's a trooper. <laughs> he's nope. a trooper for sure. Well, <laughs> Thank I'm you so, here. so much. Thank yeah. you so much for uh, uh, joining us. Guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, and let, let's say uh, let's do this again sometime and talk baseball. Absolutely, and uh, you guys have a good night. I know you're in a very different time zone, so go get some rest. Yeah, it's just after half past midnight here. The Yankee game's been rained out, I think, so I'm just going to wait and watch whatever baseball they end up playing. Oh yeah, you got to stay up for a while. Tomorrow morning, to baseball to watch. Yeah. So. Oh, I'll, I'll watch it on demand tomorrow. It's been rain delayed, so I don't think I'm going to stay up much longer. Oh, <laughs> right. Struggling there, Jason. Yeah, the peer pressure. Uh, you got, you're a baddie. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, send me some, and I'll do it next time. Um, yeah, thanks again, Matthew, and good night. All right, thank you guys. Have a great one. <laughs> bye, bye. bye. bye.